Welcome to the August 26th work session. If you join me for a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, all right, we're moving on to citizens' comments. Seeing none, uh, just item number 3A, the uh, Arts Center Strategic Plan. I'll turn it over to Joe Macy Archer. Uh, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Nikki Presser. Okay. All right. Nikki? Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Nikki Presser, uh, Arts Center Manager. Uh, most often known as the new Joe. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, and just talking a little bit about the strategic plan. So I'll just give you some basic information about what went into creating this strategic plan and uh, some of the goals that came out of it and some of the work that uh, the planned work that's coming up and the work that we've already done. So uh, the plan development began in spring of 2023. And city staff, the advisory board members, as well as the friends of the Art Center board members got together. Um, and uh, also a consultant, a consulting company, Aurora, came in and helped facilitate uh, those workshops in that process. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, and so it was a two-day process with Aurora. Uh, the first day consisted of looking at sort of where we're at, and what, our, what the vision is going to be for the next five years. And then the second day was identifying some barriers uh, to those goals and then creating some direction and strategies to overcome those barriers and meet those goals. Uh, and the strategic plan is a five-year plan. So that first, on that first day then coming, uh, determining sort of what our current reality is, you can see, uh, and these are <coughs> some of our accomplishments uh, and up to the point where the strategic plan process uh, began. And this is uh, just a few of them. There were a lot more, so this is a bit of just sort of a summary. Um, so that, the, of course, the big one was the purchasing of that fine arts building um, and addition to the build to the performing arts building as well, and that included a loading dock. Um, lots of construction, the construction of that bad show in amphitheater at Casperson. Light of the Lake series that came along with that amphitheater then. Uh, a new event, which was the Art Hall. <coughs> and then also just increasing the size of that Lakeville Art Festival, so the largest art festival uh, to date has happened. Um, expanding a lot of expanded community outreach and expansion and increase of programs. And that new um, building came with, with a 300% increase in visual arts programming. So that's pretty good. Pretty big accomplishment. Wow. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that was looked at was uh, some trends in our community here, what's changing about the participants who are coming into the building. Obviously, the population increase in the Lake Bill and the area. Um, and with the growth of the population, then uh, the makeup uh, becoming more diverse economically and culturally, uh, which then of course creates growing needs for youth programming. And social media, of course, is just becoming such a big part of everyone's lives and then trying to sort of connect it up with uh, getting people to come on out and have some in real life kind of experiences. Next thing that uh, the group looked at was both the strengths of the art center as well as um, some gaps or some boulders to some of these goals and changes that will come as part of the strategic plan implementation. So, um, of course, people, staff, the community, the volunteers, the board, um, such huge support for the arts, which is amazing. Um, when it comes uh, municipal support to so the financial and philosophical support of that um, art center and work that's done there. Uh, Lakeville um, Art Festival, obviously a strength, always growing it sounds like, 
speaks from year to year, uh, and it sounds like it's a really popular for both the participants as well as the artists that come in. The location is obviously a strength. Um, and then having 20 plus years uh, under the sort of belt, so to speak, of the art center of success. That's a lot of years of um, being successful and the consistent growth to the top of those 20 years. Uh, and then some of the gaps or barriers, um, challenges, opportunities maybe, um, are just making sure that the public is aware, public awareness. Um, and as your programming grows, then of course you have a need for more staff, more people to run all those program, all that programming. And we're definitely in a growth phase, so that's always a tricky time figuring that out. Um, and then questioning and looking back at is the legacy programming still the best programming that is still effective, or are some shifts need to be made? Um, and while there is a uh, uh, as probably most of you know, that parking lot that's there has some good accessible parking to the quite close to the door, easy access if you are in a wheelchair. If when we have events on site, some of the large events, then our the parking gets very limited very quickly. Um, and then just a very competitive market, especially for youth programming. And I'm sorry, maybe I'm kind of moving through these pretty quickly. Does anyone have any questions about anything I've switched to so far? Mm -hmm. um, so once, you know, just looking at sort of what the strengths are, um, what some of our challenges are, and sort of determining what should our goals be for the next five years. And so what this slide um, talks about is not specific goals, um, but just sort of overarching. Um, goal for the arts organization, so or for the arts sector. So, wanting to connect to a diverse community through accessible experiences, accessible meaning, you know, maybe there's programming for kids on the spectrum or with other different abilities, but also um, economically accessible as well. Uh, pursuing different revenue sources to support the mission, um, collecting and using data to inform uh, decisions. So using all the information we have to make more decisions, uh, <coughs> providing more opportunities for, for youth and for service organizations to engage with the arts, which is connecting with the community even more, enhancing all of the, the art, the events that we do, and then thinking about developing new ones, perhaps. Um, let's see, having a uh, thriving state-of-the-art program. Uh, establishing engagement opportunities that create community investment and fostering an artist network. Those are sort of some of the big overarching goals that, let, that lead to some of the specifics that I'll talk about a little bit next. Uh, so to kind of break down some of those bigger picture items, um, the group came up with three strategies and there's some we need different elements that need to those, but the three strategies are planning for facility development and community growth, engaging the community with new programming, and collaborating to strengthen arts in the community. And then those um, were broken down into each section was broken into three different categories too, that you can see there. I won't take you through each one of those as we're looking at this slide. We'll dig into those a little bit deeper um, in the next two slides. Unless anyone has any questions about anything that's up there. I'll just move on to some of the more specific items. Um, and so, other than some of those strategies and an implementation plan, thinking about, uh, and this is again, um, it's a snippet. I mean, there's a lot, uh, there was a lot more. Um, the way that is in each one of these uh, slides. <coughs> uh, there's a lot more to each one, uh, but I'm just giving kind of a snippet because it was, it's just to be very, it's a lot, a lot of information and this group came up with just a ton of ideas and ways to grow the arts and service, make improvements and such. Um, but just a few items that were included in what would be the implementation plan. And this is split up into two categories. Um, one would be the friends 
uh, the Lakeville Area Art Center Board, and the other is the Advisory Board. So trying to sort of split some of those tasks um, between those two organizations, and then of course the staff is working across across everything, working with both boards. Um, but having the assistance from those two boards on some specific tasks helps keep us all, you know, on track and having some uh, some of the answers to us when we get through. Um, so for the friends, they're fo focused on some of the facilities. Um, and of course, the Friends is connected to the art festival, so talking about events and the grounds and how those are used and whether they're, you know, ADA or that kind of thing. Um, expanding the variety of the programming that we offer and exploring some new program models, um, finding new revenue opportunities. A big piece of that, of course, too, is developing new marketing initiatives to get more folks to find the system coming into the building. Um, and then shifting a membership program that has been a part of the Friends, but shifting it to the Art Center. So um, having a, a more vibrant sort of membership um, opportunity for people. And then um, <coughs> volunteers is a big part of the strategic plan as well. Um, being able to bring more community members in and utilize volunteers, which then of course with that comes from some volunteer appreciation activities with that, that kind of thing. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. So is this a shift from friends to the advisory board? Wouldn't you move it over? So the membership wouldn't be shifting to the advisory board, but oh. it will shift to the art center. So at present, it's a member, it's like a friend of the Lakeville Area Art Center membership. Oh, okay. But now what it will be is an actual membership to the art center. Um, oh, okay. And the idea being that at the art center, we it makes a little bit more sense to be a member of the art center. We have a lot of programming where we can offer, this, like for example, in the summer, summer workshops are sold out very quickly and we have a lot of wait lists. So that's probably a good way to get, um, so it's a good benefit for members that they maybe get a week early access to registering for classes, that kind of thing, which the the friends board <coughs> has a ton to offer, but not much in that way. So, yeah. Um, and then, I thought it was part of your revenue generating. It, it is, and I'll, this part I'll actually add a little bit. So, the, the friends membership, as you can see, there's not a lot of open benefits to it. So, the, the thought process through this implementation plan is to do a joint membership. You would be a member of the Art Center Advisory Board, the, the Art Center, and the Friends. And we'll work out some type of or we'll look at some type of a revenue split with them then. Um, so that this benefits both organizations, but also with the intention of growing the membership opportunities and can increase the number of members of the, the organization. So there's a lot of other models out there for membership programs. Um, over the previous five years strategic plan, we spent quite a bit of time analyzing those and looking at the structure. And Lakeville was always a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, so the new plan we're looking at some of those to try to again grow back uh, those opportunities. Thank you. Um, let's see. And then the last under the list of things that the friends will be, and again this is just a snippet, um, uh, is to do some reviewing of Google Analytics um, for both the center and um, the art festival. And then shifting over to the advisory board. Some of the things they want to be focusing on or <coughs> working with the staff to focus on is to enhance um, organizational planning, to assess our revenue streams, uh, broadening community feedback opportunities, um, an internship program, uh, establishing that program and, um, and bringing it into both buildings, the performing arts and the, the uh, finance building. Uh, offering a comprehensive, uh, offering comprehensive volunteer opportunities. And uh, finally, then connecting with regional art organizations and just local businesses and organizations. Any other questions on that one? Mm -hmm. And the Friends are um, foundation, correct? Right. So the Friends are 501c3, with, uh, so they're an autonomous board, their own bylaws, their own structure. There is crossover with some of what uh, staff does as staff liaisons, mm -hmm. but they do run their own programming, the art festival, their events, that's ultimately something they oversee. Um, 
but they do support the facility through the donations and sponsorships and other things. So pretty much everything they generate goes back to support the facility in one way, shape, or form. So. All right, and then, okay, so we're just talking about some of the implementation plans, and then, so some of the, this uh, strategic plan will run from 2024 to 2028, so there are um, some things that we've already started to work on. So here, this slide just shows a few of the achievements that we've already had. Um, that were at least in some way driven by the strategic planning. <coughs> uh, so, uh, finance committee, forming new finance committee um, as a part of friends and getting more meetings scheduled, more research and development for membership, that's already begun. Um, a grant for a new gas killing was submitted, um, and then just Speaking up new sponsors for our festival. And these are already things that have already, we've already begun work on in some cases. We started some initial conversations um, about the property planning and usage, <coughs> the property, both buildings, I guess, in property. Uh, research and design began in um, summer 2024. And uh, joint membership committee has also been formed uh, as part of the advisory board. And then we started, again, researching um, what other organizations are doing and what our current, like the correct track, what our current system will be able to do in terms of membership, um, new marketing initiatives, we've been looking into one of those is a photo opportunity at their festival, and then more work on internships, and then we'll start some new programming this fall, uh, theater arts programming for pre k to grade three. So a few things we've already kind of gotten through. So where does the grant writing come from? Is, this just, is it with a friend or is it with just your staff? So mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's two opportunities there. Well, there's more than two opportunities. The friends fall into a different category for uh, grant writing opportunities than the other center does. Okay. Um, so they have their own grant writer. They take care of their own grant applications. Um, and then the art center falls into a different category. We're talking strictly about state art for grants, that is. Um, and so in that respect, Nikki is the primary grant writer for the art center and the grant center role. Those two pieces have to be completely separate. Okay. Um, there can't be crossover between two organizations because of the way that the state art board manages those. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And this particular grant was um, a, a member of the Friends Board is writing the grant, but it, it's not an art board grant, it's a separate grant with um, an energy. Okay. Mm, this last page, uh, there's a class slide that talks, um, this shows a little bit of a breakdown for the first of the month. These are some of the items that we're looking to do them, and these are the deadlines we're hoping to get them accomplished by. And I think I might have already run out of time. So <laughs> oh no, we always run over time. That's a good question. So, like I said, we, the grant has been submitted by hopefully by October of 2024. The friends will have that grant secured, so fingers crossed, and then we'll have some internship docs. We'll take the research we've done and get some job descriptions put together for internships um, and some uh, new marketing possibilities. Also in October, evaluating the new programming that we're rolling out um, in September, and then um, we'll have some options for membership that we can sort of report out and we make some decisions on. January, I don't know how much you want if you want me to keep going through all of these. I know you got the reason, so. Um, but new mm -hmm. membership, yeah. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about what some of the options are for membership? Um, because early access to things, are there other types of benefits that we're looking at? If you, if you want to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think some of the some of the programs that we've seen that have been successful, and there's a couple of reasons, one, that a vibrant membership program is important. One, it, um, it helps to build return customers, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, it helps to build, um, you know, their involvement. It helps to give us a database also for volunteers and all those things. 
Um, but the programs that we've seen that have been very successful have uh, provided, yes, early access for registrations, um, but also potential discounts for classes or um, being able to put together pricing for um, like season tickets, those types of things. All structured right now, because of how it was structured, we weren't able to do any of that through our database. It was all through the friends. Um, by switching it, we're going to be able to utilize software that we already have and then, again, use that to kind of build that return customer. We have a lot of return customers, but I think it's going to just create another avenue for growth. So, yeah. so there's, there's quite a few reasons. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can talk about Yeah, the season ticket item has come up quite a bit over the past few years. So. Yeah, thanks to get people to commit to yeah. coming and to the dance, but also mm -hmm. pretty much on the to get people to come here in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had a couple of questions about kind of the whole process. One, was there any kind of conversation about um, increasing daytime offerings? Uh, whether it's like targeted to, to seniors and targeting with Heritage Center. And I, I did see that I think Parks is going to start doing some homeschool stuff at Ritter. So any like daytime conversation? So you probably have more information about this, but we are, we will be offering starting in the fall, there will be some daytime programming for pre k kids. Okay. Arts, so we will do some of that. Um, and then the uh, visual arts programming too, like in the new fall schedule, there are definitely some daytime um, adult classes primarily, and I believe there's one or two um, homeschool focused yeah, classes during the daytime. And I'll just add, yeah, to add to that, the, um, historically we've had a pretty robust daytime schedule for the visual arts programs. Mm -hmm. um, if the performing arts classes, just because of lack of space when we had just the one building, mm -hmm. that really did suffer with daytime offerings. That's something that you've jumped on already and has some new programs going uh, scheduled for fall. Okay. Okay. Definitely focus. And then my other question was, was there a conversation about just the site? Um, obviously, we acquired the new building. Is it working out? Do we need to think about facilities? We own a lot of land around there um, between that and the parking lot and then the lot behind it. So just thinking, is there like... What, what conversation is going on and, and does it jive with the downtown development guide, those type of things? Yep, so uh, that is uh, you'll, one of the tasks on that first 18 month plan is that joint facilities committee and part of that is to look at how all of those larger festivals are using the site, how the art center programs are using the site, how it's working with the new um, downtown development guide and then also the parking study that um, planning uh, worked on last year uh, because there are some changes to the grounds on the northern end of the site due mm -hmm. to that. Um, so that the plan was to look at all of those together and try to create a site plan that maybe helps with the festivals, um, you know, look at how we're using things to think in, in, in totality. So, yeah. Great. Council, have a question? Okay. Thank you both for the presentation. Yep. We will look forward to hearing more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, moving on to the next item, City Commission appointment process. I will turn I'll Mr. take on. that. Um, as I'm doing that, Alan, could you yeah. love it? Uh, see what I can do. So, um, at the annual goal site and retreat, one of the items that you asked staff to come back with was just a, a further discussion about the City Commission appointment process. Um, and I put in the memo what you've done recently and. Um, as you know, you changed it a little bit this past year and that you held almost all of the interviews on one day um, on a Saturday this year. And I think that worked well um, from what I gather. Um, so, um, you know, there's that. So you can talk about it if you want to continue with that. And then there's also um, just a request to talk about um, or do a little bit of research on term limits. Currently, we have no term limits on our city commissions. The only thing that we do have is a limitation on how many times the, uh, somebody can serve as chair of the planning commission. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all we have there. But um, I did put in a memo what some of our comparable cities do, and it's all over the map. Some are similar to us. They don't have many term limits. Some have different staggered terms with exceptions and things like that. So I um, just wanted to bring it back to the council and see if there's any desire to, to do any changes as we move forward for next year. Okay, very good. 
Um, let's start with the process. Everybody, any thoughts or recap from last year? I uh, I thought the uh, single day process was. I I liked it. Yeah. Um, it's all in one. It was a lot easier to keep track of the candidates, and it, it seemed to flow pretty well. Um, so I would encourage continuing with uh, with that. Yeah, I think the only thing for me was, if, and it's so hard with people's schedules, is we could do one board in a chunk if possible. Like yeah. all the planning yeah. commissions. Mm -hmm. At one time. At one time. In the day. But. No, I liked it too. It was better than, um, you know, spreading it out over multiple weeks. You were able to stay a little more focused on, on the task. You guys come to the room? Yeah, I think that uh, maybe a, I'm considering do a final maybe if you can get it arranged that way, it would be nice to have just like a small break in there to be able to organize the class. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately what we're getting to do, you know, when we get to the end, it's going to be yep. more efficient. My, my only has a I think we should continue to do it on that one day, but on a year where it's a very popular um, commission year where we have a ton of applications, that's when that will become really challenging. Um, and I don't remember who brought it to our attention, uh, some other city or county process where they need video submissions so that there could be a first round um, kind of review from home. So if we needed to do some oh. cuts before doing those in-person interviews, I think that might help us on a year that has too many yeah. to on one day. I'd be hoping that if, if we did get a bunch too many. I mean, that's because we don't really have it written down per se. It's just we get to decide mm -hmm. what the policy is. But I'd be fine with that. Um, I did have some thoughts about term limits. I don't know the rest of you. I think, in general, I think something makes sense. The one thought I had was planning should probably be a little bit longer uh, only because I, should, I think they should at least get through a comp plan and have some experience before that. So if you have like a, you know, four or three year terms, that's 12 years, you know, you're through a comp plan process in there. But I don't know what you guys think about term limits. I, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that, and I don't have an issue with them. I, I agree with you, Luke, that it would be long, better to have like a longer term limit, but just having it stop. I see that there's one city here uh, that will do, what is it, Bloomington, no more than six consecutive years, then a gap before a new appointment. Um, so something, I, I encourage a longer one, and I don't know if we have to decide well, arts commission is going to be two years, but planning is going to be three or four years if, if we want to do that or just make them all the same. But I, uh, I think there's some benefit to it. Um, but I would, I just would not, I like Bloomington's deal where it's like, okay, if you turned out, that doesn't mean we're absolutely done either uh, that you come back. I think it is a fresh perspective. Yeah, I mean, that Edina's, if you're going to do Edina's is two, three-year terms and planning has three three-year terms for the one-year gap. Um, I think your comments on, on planning are, are critical because I, you know, having been on a planning commission, I know it takes at least a year to figure out what the heck's going on and whether you should say something because it's complicated and there's a lot of processes there. Um, but I think generally, though, I'm... Um, I don't think I'm generally a fan of term limits, I guess, on this. I think that's kind of our job to assess that. And I think we, you know, the last couple cycles we have, mm -hmm. um, we've removed, I mean, not removed, but haven't reappointed people with a long, um, with some long longevity on both parks and planning. And, I, and it's not just planning, too. I think finance is another good example, too, of unique, unique skill sets for that, that, um, that it's going to be um, challenging to find in some, some cases. So. I think that with having the attendance um, schedule, that we, so that we know mm -hmm. their attendance. I think the other thing is, is that I think we're qualified enough to figure out know, if they're still bringing value. Um, mm -hmm. Through our questioning, we usually ask them, you know, have those persons that are um, asking to return. Usually we were asking them something to the effect of you know, what value they have brought um, 
that type of thing. So I think it's really up to us to determine if we think somebody is not qualified as a doctor. And I realize, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it just works itself out. People's lives change. And so we do have people that don't um, come back because of their life uh, changes. Um, I don't know, I, I think it would be, <coughs> I'd be concerned that we're always finding the quality candidates that we need because sometimes we're looking at some of the people that apply aren't really up to stuff compared to what we already have. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the issue lies, is that we do have a lot of quality candidates. Mm -hmm. As I reflect on the conversations we've had, it's really hard to allow someone new into the process because we've had such great people in this role. And so when we start talking about qualifications, certainly the person that's been on the board long, longer one at all, in comparison to the new person is going to have the qualifications more so. So where I see the challenge is offering opportunities to newer residents uh, or younger residents um, because we've, we've had these discussions before, and, and it's, it's, have, have you turned down the experienced uh, person, individual? So, I, as I look at the, the <coughs> comparable cities, I really do favor the Edina or even Perry model, where there was a gap because it allowed at least an opportunity, but not in, uh, a definite end forever. It just created that space because I just know how our conversations have been, and it's really challenging to say no. Um, I, I'd be open to the gap concept um, as well. I mean, but I, I uh, not an absolute limit, I don't think. But. And that's, that's what I said earlier. I, I think the gap is important, and that is a challenge that we have each time. Is you got somebody and, and it would just be nice for some openings to, to naturally happen um, or find some way to get people that are less qualified but they're trying for this and, and they would like to try it. We do that sometimes with the uh, Kemper, the one that the alternate, the alternate terms where they at least get a taste of it. Um, but it still can be quite some time. I just think I, I just think for some way to have some kind of, uh, of a term limit and then just, but not just telling somebody now you can't do it anymore and just come back in here. So what if they are an alternate? Is there a term limit on the alternate status? Mm -hmm. well, I think you see different models. And I mean, the other cities are in the only terms that count are the full terms, not the alternate terms. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's hard to say that we're going to have that gap. Yeah. 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 Y
process. I don't know how that works. What about chair limitation for planning? Three years? Uh, I believe it's three years. Three one-year kind of terms. Three, custom, I, I think, think it's three one-year terms. Mm. Like consecutively? Yeah. I mean, Intended. planning commission is actually the only committee commission that's in code. Yeah. The rest are established well, by resolution. And it's, I mean, and it's, it's, it's required it's by statute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time commitment. So does anybody have a bright idea on where what would direction you <laughs> want to go or mix us the model? It sounded like Woodbury's unanimous vote mixed with Edina's is what some people say. I think it's one of those things that I mean unless we have some overwhelming opinion, I mean it, it isn't gonna hurt to keep it how it is, but I would say I would want to do something uh, if we did establish term limits, I think longer longer possibility of service and the ability, I just want the ability to say, no, nah, I think somebody needs to stay on here because I would pay to have some high level of expertise walk out the door mm -hmm. because we set a term limit. So the other question would be if there were term limits and you finish your one term and how you would like to do the second term. Do you reapply to the council or do you just um, are giving your ability to um, yeah. state your term? I mean, that's a question. I wonder if these cities don't do interviews in between terms. What we do? Um, I don't know for sure. I'm just anecdotally, we're one of the few cities that interviews mm -hmm. incumbents. Yeah. Because we don't have term limits. Right. So that's, you know, makes sense for their reason. I'd be in favor of moving that direction if we're creating this process for. Of not interviewing I'm not inter assuming, you know, there's a, a favorable record for the term. Um, but that's how we lean anyway. Um, over the past few years, all the last six years, the incumbent always has the advantage. So, um, this process, mm -hmm. and moving down the side, mm -hmm. you have, you both, mm -hmm. um, you have, you have, you have, let's say the finance, and both the incumbents are going to say, yes, they want to leave for another term, which doesn't leave any opening. Do you not post an opening? No, because I think, in my opinion, the council should, because you're not appointed to nine years or whatever you're appointed to the term, so the council could still say, so even without interviewing, we're going to move in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. You know, right? So you, you created the term limit. Right, but, you're, but it's, you still add the three years, it's like an option to renew. Almost, right? You Where still have to apply. Yeah, you still have to apply so you're going to come back. But you wouldn't have to interview, I think, is what Joshua was saying. So we'd interview just the new people, and we look at the list and say, oh, okay, well, based on what we understand about this person's performance, we still feel fine with them there, kind of thing. Because the term limit doesn't mean that, oh, okay, I just got appointed, so I'm on for nine years. It's right. the term, and so we still have that. Um, that decision making um, voice that you're talking about, Michelle, that yeah, your performance might not have been up to snuff, so we're gonna we're gonna go a different direction. Um, or, you know what, you're really an asset that we need, so we're gonna extend that if you want. If you so desire. But it's not a guarantee, a term limit isn't a guarantee to if I get my five three year terms. I still like getting the uh, interviews because I feel like we learn a lot on, mm -hmm. you know, advice from those people on what they think we should be focusing on. It's actually, I appreciate the one-on-one -on -one time for 10 minutes to get feedback. Well, I think then, like this, this year we had everybody scheduled, right? Because then I think some, some, a couple of them we decided we didn't need because they're the only options. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I think that's something 
play by ear like the other applicants mm -hmm. decide to need yeah, great name for I mean, I, I would also think that if we were leaning towards not reappointing somebody, that we would still give them the chance to have an interview, you know, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that just makes it kind of performance based. Like the case. So I hear still interview. Mm -hmm. Regardless. Um, I don't, I don't know where we're at with the majority of folks on the Adina Liberty hybrid model. I'm in favor of that. So there's two of us. <coughs> Sounds like Michelle doesn't was not wanting to remove it. I think I'm 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 still a no unless um, the only thing I would support would, would be a the be a the gap. So it's not a permanent term of it, it's a yeah, I mean, that's, I get it once. that's what I'm proposing. Yeah. I, I would go one more step and make it a triple hybrid <laughs> because I just don't want to lose the ability. There are some, <laughs> some circumstances where somebody brings something that nobody else is going to. I would just hate to, it, you know, it would be a decision we'd have to make to extend that. But I, I would say the Bloomington Edina with, with some terms, the one year gap, I talked about that before. But also that we have the ability to uh, to extend the term. I mean, it's our discussion. Yeah. Kind of saying. So what we're proposing is no more than two three-year terms, except for planning is three three-year terms. One year gap before new appointment after the term. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if you meet your term limit but you need to be kept, it can be extended by noon. So. Yeah, that's. Yep. For what a term or a one year? For another turn. For another turn. No. I don't think we want to get out of the cycle. <coughs> so I would at least point of another turn. Yeah. So, John, you're okay with that? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. So, just so I'm clear, I heard um, exactly how Edina is. Two three year terms, planning commissions, three three year terms. Yep. A one year gap if you've maxed out after that. Yep. And anybody can be extended for another term by unanimous vote with the council. Yep. If you need your term yeah. Okay. Right. Um, we will work on um, an, ordinance. an ordinance and we'll bring that. Then the other piece, I don't know if that would go to but just that we're, we would interview. Yeah, that, that's, that's just part of our that's just, part Yeah, of our I wouldn't put that in the ordinance. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, we're done. So <laughs> let's let's try to get through the budget stuff with Julie, and then depending on how that goes, maybe we take a break before we do the CIP. Does that work for everybody? Julie, you're seven minutes ahead. It doesn't mean you have seven more minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so going into this budget season, um, we will have a challenge of the tax values and tax base of the city not growing all that much. So 3.4% for tax capacity, 2.8% that was in construction. So 0.6% in evaluation increases. So not a lot of... Uh, Pushing there for all the growth things that we're going to be doing to the development city. Um, the fire department model and adding those full time fires and continuing to do so, adding another six in 2025. Those numbers are built into the budget. Um, the way we have positioned the budget, we are not including in, in the numbers that are included for the tax body, not including the position requests that you um, that were listed out. We did include the six full time fires that council already approved in the last budget cycle of the additional six. Um, but at this time, and we actually, for, there were four police officers <coughs> in the last budget cycle that were um, scheduled to start November 1st of 2024. Instead of that, we're going to have two starting November 1st of 2024 and then the other two starting in June of 2025. Um, timing issues and just so we believe that um, filling of positions is gone that each even seems more feasible 
as you know, start to use and adding more on top of those, uh, really, really add, add to more, you know, so we can make that mean, or get that, those holy skills. Um, and then a lot of things that changed, um, that changed during the pandemic, there are some one-time costs in 2024 budget that now those reduced um, the overall picture. So if they kind of like offset the additional increases, you know, when we're going, when we look at the expenditures in the general fund, you know, there's, there's one time cost that the fall supply, you know, $245,000. The whole ESMA implementation, you know, that was a one time to 370000 So those decreases from last year's budget to this year's up cushion, the increases that we were seeing just the you know, total and all that other, those other costs. Um, the way we have structured it also, we've got the debt levy set at um, 105% required portion of, of the, what we need to levy, need to bond, and for interest. We do have some wiggle room in those debt service funds, um, so we could play with that and then bring down some of that levy portion. That so would take away our contingency ability in the future years. Not that it wouldn't say that it would jeopardize it, it just would lessen the most contingency amount. Um, the other thing that is also affecting the increase is the having to add in dollars into the building equipment and technology funds. So those three together is six hundred thousand dollars worth of our levy. Um, where last year we weren't having to levy anything in those. Um, so and that's those are really nothing in 2025 in those budgets is a, um, unrealistic or un unnecessary. Those are, are trying to keep those fund balances positive. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the big, big piece of the whole levy increase is the park referendum levy. And as I noted in the council packet, that was. Um, mm -hmm. Of the 13.4 percent, that was how much percent? 2.4 percent of the release of the park referendum. So, um, and we knew that going into this budget, we knew that this was going to be our, our big hit here. Um, so, we're trying to look in, at ways that what council is comfortable with what we thought have going forward into the September proposal. But that's the, what will go out into the notice of the, you know, the property in November. So the good news is with um, the way we have a structure right now, our tax rate is, would still be less than what the tax rate was in 2009 when the big hit the market hit. Um, so our tax rate is still the lower tax capacity rate here. Um, and if you look at, and here's another question for the council to think about, do we want to have comparative information up to the other Detroit county cities, the other <coughs> county cities, or to our comparable cities, and what their tax rates are, tax rates are, and their increases in their levies, because we're not the only ones that are seeing double digit increase, especially for the cities that are also going to those full-time fires. Um, so, we're not alone in this battle, but it, 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 it's a peaceful battle for sure. Um, you, you say that was kind of a rhetorical question. When you say include comparative cities, what do you mean? Is that back notice or? In, I think that for what comes up to the next week, company meeting. Here's our compare. It's not even just enough, but we haven't included it in the package. Here's where we sit compared to our neighboring cities. Dakota County or our comparable cities to the size of those other cities in the area of those um, And I think it's important to keep in mind because they go in the air, so one go lower. It's not so low as far as the tax capacity is. So, you know, it's, it's kind of to help keep perspective also. Um, so it's just a thought, and then, you know, I'm just hoping to get any kind of feedback on what council feels about having that kind of information and sharing it. Because a lot of other cities, actually, their councils want that, and they want it 
in every meeting they talked about budget. What's everybody else doing? What's the goal? Is Ron Machine there as a budget? Is this thing you want to speak of? Is there the number? Um, and I know it's not always apples to apples because we all have different needs and all. You know, some people are franchising, some don't. Um, so, um, but, <coughs> so, well, and I'll probably just touch back to the, when you're looking at the way we structure the budget now, um, just looking at that median home value, if we put the budget in place that we've got it, not adding any new positions other than the full time players. That median home valued at a four hundred fifty one thousand would be a hundred and fifty one dollar a year increase in the city portion of the property taxes. Um, and there weren't a lot of changes on the general fund revenue side of it other than the property taxes. Um here we also increase something charges for services and parts and rack increase the investment income based on how the market's been um, this last year. Hoping that there'll be some continuation of that for a, for a little while at least. Um, so the other thing that I just wanted to mention with the um, state programs, you know, we did apply again for the second round. Um, what we would get in the first year is one point seven million. Um, and realizing that that could offset all of the new positions that we've on the zone on place. But again, understanding we've still got to build out the rest of the different fire model on staffing tomorrow. So there's a lot of information in here and I don't want to like see the overkill of anything. Um, but does anyone have any questions on um, what was in the fact that we're not not suggesting we use any general fund reserves and what that would leave us at the end of 2025 budget is 50 percent of fund balance. Um, it would be a 48.5 percent fund balance of 15 point six expenditures. So it's still very healthy fund balance. So you know council has any strong feelings about possibly using some fund balance to just bring down the levy portion of it. I'm not saying it's something I recommend, but it, it's an option. Um, Do you have a question, Jim? Can I get a question about the debt service sure. portion of this? So if I'm reading it correctly, 3.5% of that 9.63 is just existing debt service. Is that right? I don't know what the part referendum on that. I'm the wrong. Yeah. Park and. So a third of it is, is debt service. Yeah, the, you're right. The park reference is 2.41, but, so, but our hands are tied on that. You're right, Dan, and you know it should be noted that starting in 20 with the 26 budget, that number will be built into the levy. So we aren't going to be issuing any more debt for the park bond referendum, okay. and so you won't see a similar or commensurate 2% increase because it's built in. Answer, answer your question earlier. I think it would be helpful just to, you know. If we kind of understand it where we are in the county, because people always ask that question, so just having information is good. Obviously, peer cities, you know, the same ones that we're always looking at is also helpful. Um, you know, I the first thing I thought about was thinking about fund balance and how we can use that to be a little bit more aggressive on the the levy. I mean, I, you know. Um, Clearly, the economy is slowing down. It's impacting our ability to generate revenue. And, you know, when you don't have a single apartment coming this year other than Astoria, it's a signal that, you know, there's there's other stuff at play. Um, you know, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, obviously home valuations have slowed down, increased. So there's a lot of stuff at play, obviously, is making this a very challenging budget, which is why we all went in gas last year when we saw the, you know, what this was going to look like, and now here we are, so. Well, and for me, I think also on top of the, um, I know that's a separate discussion, but the franchise fee discussion on top of this, too. I know, because that's another hundred and forty. Yeah, two years of 10, year. 10 percent increases. So it's 290 a year in one year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm getting older, so 
they come in my household is yep. going down. My husband's now retired too. So getting that proper tip that was always the killer. And it's not just us. <coughs> it's the other entities on the bill. Mm -hmm. But you know, knowing that I have to budget another I realize that it doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, 150 here, 144 next. Uh, whatever, if the school district's referendum passes, whatever that increase is, just, just, and it's just rolling on top. And we've known as a council that this was the tough year. We, you know, we've for years we've known this was going to be the tough year. So. Um, but I don't want to jeopardize our credit rating by doing something like not paying uh, to, to mess around with the debt payments or anything. I, I think that was, we would be, we're fine um, covering our debt pieces, but I would never go for that. Um, there's a little bit of cushion in a couple of debt service funds, but we could use that cushion this year, still not jeopardizing the participants when it was of any of the bond issues. Oh, I, I missed what it was just here. No, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, it's probably just my brain. It doesn't always come to the thing with everybody else. Um, so, you know, in my, I understand we have, we've made some really big commitments by wanting to get our public safety up to par. And we're going to have to bite the bullet on that, and I realize that that's what I have to pay for when it comes rolling in, but it's so tough. I'm not going to be the only one experiencing how tough it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. When, what's the timing on, on getting the safer grant? Um, yes or no? I, I feel like it was like November last year. Oh, yeah, October, November. Yeah, so after the preliminary is adopted. Yeah. We did get, you know, I'm not going to say we're reading TVs or anything, but we did get um, a request for more information this time, okay. which we did not get last time. So. Um, that's a positive. That that's a po that's a positive. <laughs> that's a positive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a positive sign. Yeah, you know? um, and you know, just to note, I mean, while we would receive if we do get it, um, 1.7 million for next year, we would want to work out some sort of schedule where, you know, if at the end of those three years, we're faced with a two million dollar yeah. bill, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that we absorb. All that one, or take all of that off of the levy, we probably put some away so that we kind of feather in that levy increase when it got to that. Point. I think though, there's some cities in the county, at least in the congressional district, that have gone back for a safer around two. You probably can. Yeah. I don't, I because I always thought it was just was your first couple of year implementation, but you can go apparently not for this. Yeah. You know, it's like a lottery thing. Yeah. A couple of things. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, just a reminder: this is the preliminary levy um, right. that we have to adopt by September 30th. Um, the current plan is that we'd bring this back uh, at your next week's meeting if we were to get some guidance tonight. If not, we would um, then bring it back at that second meeting in September. We always tweak this, right? And we always try to figure out ways to lower between the preliminary and the final, and we would continue to do that. Um, the big, some of the big changes in this are obviously the increases in the um, equipment fund, e facilities, technologies, and things like that. Um, and that's one, because we have some needs and some requests, but two, it's also to, as we formulate those plans and you look and they're in your packet o over 10 years, um, we do try to preserve those fund balances in that so that we don't have some massive spikes. That being said, there's some pretty expensive equipment coming up in the next couple of years. Um, and so uh, I did ask Julie, and she looked today. We might have some um, some leeway in some of those funds, especially as we look at, the, at our contributions from the liquor fund. So um, that would be one of the ways that we would look at supplementing those funds between whenever you set the preliminary and then the final levy, because um, that would help obviously offset those pretty expensive ones. Joshua? Um, I'm not 
I guess my comment starts with that looking at the increase, I, I pulled harmless the uh, park reference because that was voter approved uh, bonding that we needed to do. Um, but the remaining increase, I do I think all of us would be more comfortable to look at double digit increase. Um, and I think if I did my math correctly, that that requires at least a five hundred thousand dollar cut somewhere um, to get under ten. If, if you take out the park referendum, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So not the total uh, levy increase would be above 10, yeah. but it would be basically it's 11%. 12.4. I mean, 13.4 with the park. Right. Take out the park. 11%. Yeah. Without the park. Right. So that in the percentage point is about half a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, to me, that's my target because uh, for a couple of reasons, I think it's it's helpful talking to residents about these increases. I about a few different things. But comparably to our other cities, I think we have hung our hat um, on the fact that we are on the lower end, if not the lowest city in the county. Um, that wasn't true last year. So the second, us and Egan are always neck and neck. So I, I think we're usually proud to be at the, the lowest and with the tax um, bracket in the county. Uh, and the county is always the lowest county in the state. So, so there are you know, important factors. Um, but we're growing fast, so I, I can rationalize the increases. And as I was looking line by line at everything that we're asking for, I couldn't identify personally what is that needed. Um, and so I don't know what the like, combination of uh, fund balance versus cut versus the increase in revenue for the liquor. I don't know what combination it is, but I think that's the number in my head that I'd like to get to somehow. Um, but I don't know if that's, if that's feasible um, from a staff perspective. So you're wanting to go through the proposed assessment that there is adoption of something closer to that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's a double digit increase. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone sitting in this room. Or, or you know, I've had a lot of conversations to uh, at people's doors and, and talking with citizens. And I think the big thing is is there's two things. Number one, it, it will be helpful to have that. Uh, tax capacity rate information for two reasons. Number one, it does show how we compare, but number two, um, it provides a case for reasonableness. Uh, because I think, you know, when people, when budgets go up, people go, well, what's going on? Well, we're funding public safety, we're funding, um, you know, additional parks uh, and personnel. I don't think there's anything in here that's not reasonable. We aren't gold plating the toilets or, you know, anything like that, or, you know, sending just into Maui Maui for, <laughs> you know, we, we aren't doing anything like that. So I, th I think it's reasonable. Um, and I'm confident that if we adopt a levy, uh, and once again, yeah, I agree, hold, up, hold harmless the, um, the, uh, the park referendum part. But if we adopt that, and, you know, staff has always been really good about starting from there and going, okay, where can we find what we're going to cut. Um, I don't think this is a surprise, and I think you know, I can justify it talking to people that it's reasonable. Um, I would really, really think hard about the fund balance. I think the higher, the better for that, especially when we start thinking about our bond rating. Um, we, we could make a decision that could cascade and cause some, some issues. So I think um, part of it is, is, is considering what the uh, bond rating is that we're getting and the interest rates that that provide. And that's a tax savings for people. That's another argument that is we're AAA and that gets you, that's saving you money for a citizen. Um, so I, I, think, I think we move forward. Uh, wish it were single digits. I would love to see it at single digits. Um, I just, I'm not, I, I, I'm not confident that that will happen, but I'm sure that you will work really hard to, to see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and uh, make the cuts and the adjustments that, that we need to make to defer this. Because it's not, it, I'm not even sure it's just this year. I think we're going to see a little bit period of time where our infrastructure, our personnel, our equipment and everything is catching up with our population growth, which is slowing. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you know, this is, this is part of what uh, uh, we're going to experience with uh, the economy the way it is and the valuations and all that. It's good to know we're not in it alone. So in, in theory, we could wait to adopt until September 17th? Yes. Instead of another third. You'd have to do a special meeting if you wanted to. Um, or, I mean, we could we could hold a meeting whenever to adopt it. You just have to do it by the 30th. By the 30th, okay. Can I ask one um, about on the six firefighters? Um, is there a reason we have to do all six firefighters? You know, we're doing six each year. Is there a reason that can't be stretched out more? I, I think I'm assuming there's an operational rationale for it. Yep. So the current six that you have right now are two per shift. So you can create three shifts covering 24-7. And then the next six are just adding two to those, but you come out with four on there from the, if you remember back from the, the study that we did, our, our goal was immediately staff one truck and then followed by staffing the second truck. So the next six gives us uh, two full time to staff the second truck, and then we backfill the next two positions with a band call. So it's, it's a mix, a combination hybrid. So you have four full time on, and then four band call that are, are filling the seats on both trucks or two trucks. You remind me there are different stations, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, now they're staffing at station four. Next year, we'll move the second truck at station one. And I, I can't remember from your presentation, but what's the uh, what was the percent of multi-incident, like an incident happening here, and then all of a sudden another one's happening here that requires a split response? So in the first quarter of this year, we were 174 ish calls that were simultaneous. Uh, the second quarter it jumped to it doubled by 100, so it went up to 275. I think it was. Um, we had up to three incidents occurring at once. And that was like 10 times in that second quarter. The rest were uh, 260th calls, I think it was roughly, or 240, uh, were two calls simultaneously going on. And those are mostly all medical related? Uh, medical, and then like today it's been a, a rash of fire alarms, and that's just due to the heat that we're having. And we also have a heat call, so yeah. today I think we had three calls that simultaneously occurred today. In like our first six that we hired, it was three officer or three firefighters, three captains, right? Correct. Next year, it's going to be six firefighters. Six firefighters. So it's not any more officers. Well, in the report you had last week, I thought, I mean, I thought the early data showed that that was working really well, that the, the vision is being realized. That it's early, I know, but I mean, for me, this is um, a double digit increase is problematic for me. Um, but public safety is is the priority. And I think we have, um, it's not like we've overfunded that in, in either areas of police or fire in the past. Um, so some of it is we're playing, playing catch up here. So I think that's kind of where, where um, it lands for me. I'm, I'm not happy with that with double digit, especially as we're talking about the, uh, the franchise fees on a whole separate, you know, separate area. So I don't know, that's not overly definitive, I know, but it's kind of what I'm at. And just as we're talking franchise fees, um, if we move forward with that, or if we don't, um, we would be the first projects that that would be funding. The current plan is is the first center that would be starting construction next year. So we would issue the debt next year, first payment in 26. So I know there's still discussion about whether or not you do the franchise fees or you put that on the levy. That's not a decision you have to make. You don't have to levy for that in 25, I guess is what I'm saying. So. Okay. Um, 
I mean, from a staff perspective, is it sound realistic that between fund balance and taking a look at that, we can find a percent? Or yeah, I mean, what I heard was, I mean, if you wanted to hold harmless the park referendum, that's 2.4, and it were at 13.4, so that would mean, um, you know, to try to get it down basically a percent or so. So right. the final levy is 12.41. The, right, the preliminary levy that you want to see next week. Yeah, I think we can we can do that. We'll figure it out. We'll keep looking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other comments? So the other thing you have to bring over you guys is that you have to be able to explain it in one or two sentences. So the story you know, has to be explained very simply. More questions from double digits than singles. I mean, the, the one thing I do want us to think about those council, like typically we get the preliminary, it's no promise, it does, we do see, you know, some savings and, and things down the road. And now, if they do it now, we might not have some savings on. But the other thing is in the future, I want us to think about it. I don't want to be setting up a system where we're always expecting cuts so they just come with a bigger budget. Because I felt like in the eight years I've been here, it's, they don't come to present cuts. Right. They have the conversations and say, hey, we're not going to hire these positions. You know, they're telling the budget people, you know. So I just, I don't want us to well, start thinking about that. Well, we years past. And we have. First, yeah, we have. This will be the first time that the council has not spoke up and said, um, those officers that you yep. didn't put on there, we want. Yep. You know, those employees that you have listed that you said that aren't, you know, we want. So, I mean, we've added to it most of, most of the time. Yeah. And then still told them to keep it up. I know. I'm just saying, they, <laughs> I, I know this because they, they, it's, they're not showing up with an inflated budget, so yeah. I just, like, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we want to get into the CIP or do you guys want to take a five minute break or? I think it's I don't think there's a whole lot of new stuff here, so okay. I'm, yep. I'm confident that Zach and Julie can go through Let's it do it. pretty quickly. Oh, yeah, you can go over here. Yep. So, um, I'll just kick it off. Uh, the long term, or the, sorry, the financing plans for the building equipment tax from that the CIP as well as the attachments yeah. of the budget and levy. Um, so, laid it out in there, you know, the levy request um, for each of those plans, the facility plan, um, right now, as it stands, 100000 in the, the levy for 2025, equipment plan, 200000 of the levy in 2025, and technology, 300000 in the levy. Um, and it's, it's Justin mentioned, you know, we've got some big equipment stuff coming up very shortly here. Um, and of course, you know, as it continues to grow and the need for more vehicles and stuff with more staff. So um, just trying to keep the fund down to follow the rest of the levy requests. So with that, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll put it over to Zach because he's the master project. <laughs> he has other questions on the project, but. Um, Maybe just go over the things that are different in the CIP or any changes from your sure. options. Um, you, can, uh, you can see on the map here, I uh, have a nice presentation for you, just got to wait a month, so this is just a little snapshot. But um, we, we did do a couple of things, uh, as Mr. Miller alluded to, uh, we did push uh, a project back another year. So this is Dodd Boulevard, south of 20 Road 50 to 10th Street, uh, recognizing some of those, um, uh, the budget constraints and, and uh, some other funding to push this back a year. Uh, we also, and one in the northeast side of town, uh, this is a uh, roadway segment connecting plus on run subdivision and the Brookshire subdivision, we pushed this back a year as well. This is a, a highway bridge uh, crossing the North Creek. And then uh, the other significant change um, that 
appears to be happening uh, is the County Road 50 I-35 interchange is looking more and more like a 2028-2029 construction. We're still advancing. There hasn't been any delays in our management design of the project. It's just the realities of the different funding sources and the processes that are in place um, will require uh, more than likely a two-year construction in 2028. Uh, the other things that we did do um, that are reflected in this map, I, I don't have them quite memorized, but we did shift a couple of our collector rehabilitation projects, so similar to like you see today with Octava Avenue, 175th Street, Indiana. We have kind of broadened that out a little bit. Um, basically, we took uh, one full year and spread it in to try again, um, take advantage of the infrastructure and kind of uh, spread out some of the costs. And that's reflected in the whole three projects that you see on the attached map here. Can you, sorry, yep. Jack, um, the, the 202nd Street, what's the 2606? Yep, good question. So, oh, I'm sorry, 2606, yes. Yeah. Uh, that is an addition. I follow. That was uh, another one. So 2606, uh, actually. Is that the roundabout? It is the roundabout, okay. and I can give you a quick. Um, so we are, uh, the county is leading and funding the vast majority uh, of a roundabout at the intersection of County Road 50 and Hamburg Avenue. Our costs are really limited to street lights and operations, uh, which is, is really uh, small in relation to the, the whole of the project. The, uh, the county has that program for 2026. Um, but the status of the design is that we are working together to try to get that constructed in 25, 2025. Uh, we still have some sensitivity analysis to review, but uh, that is the goal of the project would be to complete that for the end of next summer. But again, uh, that is county finance. Uh, the other item that you'll see maybe different than years past is uh, 2615, uh, and these are uh, the Greenway Trail projects uh, in partnership with Dakota County. Those are primarily financed by the county as well. Uh, we'll be finishing the Lake Marion piece here between downtown and the trailhead of our farm. And then we'll also be working to complete the North Creek Greenway, Greenway here as well. Yeah, so um, you, did, you, did, you did say 2510 was delayed, or it's not? The only reason I ask that is, it, is it a challenge to have back-to-back -back projects on that road? I mean, I guess there are some, so if you're going to do the roundabout, oh, like, does it make sense to have one construction season on 50, I guess? Yeah, and, and I should clarify, 2510 is a county-led project. It's a mill and overlay. Oh, okay. It's, so it, it's, not a, it's, it's not a reconstruction. Uh, that's just, uh, I put that on there mostly to demonstrate that uh, there would be some inconveniences, but they're not reconstruction like we would see. Uh, it's a county mill and overlay, so generally take about one to two weeks. It's still open to traffic, but we use that as an opportunity to do our utility route maintenance for some okay. trees from water and also some trails. So that will stay on track up to point five. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, other than that, any other specific questions? Uh, and with in relation to any of the projects, um, you'd like to see. Otherwise, uh, the goal would be uh, September 19th is to go before the planning commission and get the recommendation in relation to the comprehensive plan. That's what we're required to do every year. Uh, we'll give this presentation that highlights some of these projects, and then um, once we're all set, we'll come back with um, final recommendations. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is the county has advanced their process there this year as well too, so we're more in sync for as they would be for the end of the year. We're a little bit closer now, so we're, um, it's not kind of that um, sequential thing, it's, it's more uh, in line with our thing. So, that's Any other questions? Okay, thank you. That was it? Alright. Um, moving on to items for future discussion. 
committee and city administrator updates. Okay. Uh, I just have one update. Um, Justin and myself and Tina and Chris and Dave met with the builders today to talk about how the city and the development community can work together when you think about some of the housing stuff that came out of the legislature. It's good to our meeting. We'll come up with some. They're going to come up with some stuff. So are we. And I think we've got, we're in a pretty decent spot. But I think with that, we're going to have them come and give us a little bit more information about what are some other products and building strategies that might be uh, advantageous to the city. So it's kind of what came out of the city. It's good news. Yep. Um, we had a pretty long committee just before this. Um, two major points I guess to talk about. One is uh, we reviewed some of the increases for health insurance premiums. And, uh, those rates, the increases were much less than anticipated. So that is very positive for us. Um, but it's already reflected. It's in the budget. Savings are in the budget? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Oh, um, so let me just kind of just pause for one second. Can, the other thing when we're doing the budget, budget presentation, can you highlight the expense related to paid leave that the state is mandating? Um, the ESSP? Yeah, is there some the sort of... Yeah, the start to 26. 26. Oh, it's 26. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was 25. Yeah. Great. So we have lots of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Next well, year. Yeah. yeah. To Joshua's point, I mean, we did get a better rate for our health insurance renewal, but in trying to get to be more competitive with our other cities, we had to increase the employer share of the contributions right on the family plan. So we could do it quite a bit lower. But it's still lower. Than, it's, it's still, still lower than. Lower. It's lower than what we were projecting. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think initially uh, the common was we were anticipating 15%, uh, or at least we're including that as part of the budget projection, you know, uh, is closer to the uh, so. uh, The other thing is we started discussing the city administrator's performance evaluation process. Is it that time of the year? We just wanted to make sure that, you know, the questions, et cetera, that the process was probably. Especially with the new director in HR. So, um, and I don't think there are you'll know, be you know, changes, but we did ask for uh, a little bit of a look at consolidating some of the questions on our 34 questions. Great, yeah. Appreciate the leadership on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have any input into that process that we should be aware of? As we do it, you know, when you get your um, survey and you fill it out and the information that you receive to be able to fill out your information you know, on your survey. Any questions? I, I mean, I think it's a pretty sweet process, but mm -hmm. I've only been there once and I thought it was very smooth. <laughs> I think it's smoother, but yeah, there's always, it's always good to look at the questions and see if you can combine some of the same stuff you know, Last was just always like this. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, the only other thing is our next meeting is Tuesday because Monday is Labor Day. So we'll be back in City Hall on the third. Other than that, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. We're adjourned. I just give you a heads up on weather. It looks really bad. Oh. Good thing we drew when we did.